And we're going. Hey, everybody. Welcome. I am Rob. Tom, and whoever has, whoever has muted, please mute. Everybody, Rob, and then unmute us. I will. But uh, I'll do that. The, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, it's a third in a series of uh, free meetups I'm doing for a lot of friends here in the uh, metro Detroit area and actually all over the world. Um, so we're all sitting at home. I figured I'd do something fun for everybody. Um, like I said, I'm Rob Kalman. I own Michigan Technology Services. We're out in Farmington Hills. Uh, Agile training and coaching. For those of you out of state, Farmington Hills is right outside of Detroit. Um, actually coming to you live from Kego Harbor right now, since we're all working from home. Um, we run all types of Agile and Scrum uh, workshops. And uh, like I said before, we're recording this, so it's fair warning. I'm going to upload it. Some of the people emailed me a little while ago. They couldn't come today, so we're going to upload it to YouTube, and they can watch it in a day or two. Um, <laughs> Ron probably doesn't remember this, but uh, about five, six years ago, I asked him to teach a workshop for me. And he said to me, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> he um, was either busy or, you know, what he, what he did say to me was good advice. He says, call my buddy Chet. And uh, so Chet and I have been, uh, we've been working together ever since, running CSM and Scrum Master and Product in our workshops. Um, so anyways, uh, Ron and Chet often partner and uh, talk about different Agile topics all over the globe. They go to Agile Alliance Conference and, and so on. Um, Ron, of course, he's one of the original authors of the Agile Manifesto. He's a, a blogger. He teaches. He writes. He's got his cat there for us. Hello, the cat lover. Um, <laughs> um, and so uh, it'd be great. And Chet, of course, is a certified scrum trainer. And a lot of you on the call, on the video conference call here, uh, uh, know him because um, he's taught some of your scrum master and product owner workshops. And, you know, he and I work together all over Michigan delivering workshops. So the game plan as to what we've got right now is going to be, I'm going to let them present. We're going to come up with some questions and answers. And then um, we'll talk, you know, about what's going on in the future because we're going to have a series of meetups. And um, so we're going to go from there. But uh, Chet, you want to start? Or Ron, you want to start up? Um, I'm going to let Ron start because he'll say something and then I'll know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> I thought you knew what we were going to talk about. Um, we could talk about what I've been thinking about just the last few days, although we won't talk about asteroids, which is the program I'm writing. Um, and that is that it seems to me that when you do software development in, in Scrum or in any, any, anywhere nearly true Agile, uh, method approach that it's obvious if you think about it what the way you have to do it what has to be done in that you're building a little bit of this product every day really every hour if you're if you're any good at it and so you and you are required by scrum as everybody knows to have a working increment of the product every single sprint starting from the very beginning, which I know everybody certainly does. And if you have a working program that you wrote in a week or two, and then a week or two later, you got to have more, and a week or two later, you got to have more, and a week or two later, you got to have more, you're going to be going over and over that program. You can't just sort of start at one end and add to it. You got to go back and revise and rework. And there are some very simple, but not necessarily easy practices that uh, you use if you're going to if you're going to be successful in in Scrum. And since what I write about on my little asteroids articles and various other little coding articles that I do is those practices, um, they're kind of fresh on my mind and. Uh, to kind of take a top level view, you need to have continuous testing so that you know that this program works and you need to have continuous code improvement so that you can in fact get it better and better instead of just worse and worse as it grows. And uh, Chet and I teach uh, developer classes on this subject. I know Chet mentions the subject when he uh, teaches his uh, scrum classes. Um, and yet we see it 
we see those practices being used far more seldom than, than we would really like. Let me come in here and, and kind of reflect on what you just said regarding revise and rework. Because I think revise and rework uh, gives the wrong impression. That, that yes, you could call it revise and rework, but it's almost always extend and uh, provide more detail. Uh, it is not the idea that you come in and throw away the stuff you did last time and build a new version of the program uh, that's just different than the one you had before, but it is the, the uh, starting with the basic ideas of what good engineering is, uh, you work in such a way that it's almost always adding stuff or maybe eliminating a little bit, but adding as opposed to eliminating great parts and redoing. The, the, the idea is that we're going to build a frame around which we're going to put the, the details uh, and the frame will evolve, but it won't be hacked off and replaced with other things if you're doing this reasonably well. Uh, I think, yes, if I, had, if I had wanted to start right off with the technical term, I would, of course, have said refactoring. Um, it turns out that what you do uh, in, a, in a, the early stages of writing this program is you write down the code that it takes to do what you want to do. And you, if you're only as good as I am, you won't really get it as clean as you might on the first time through because you know, you've got some idea in your head and you wrap it out, wrap it, wrap, here it is, and then there it is, and that, now the program works. And the next thing you do if you are wise is you refactor that program to put the things that belong together together and the things that belong apart apart um, to express the ideas that the program has in it more clearly. Uh, and a few things like that, and that, and without breaking. And that process is called refactoring, to change the way a program's design is without changing the way it works, the fact that it works. And that requires two things, at least. It requires tests, so that you know you haven't broken it. And it requires that you understand how to change code without breaking it. And uh, that is called refactoring. So, it is true that what happens is that you mostly just add things. Today, for example, um, I had an asteroids program that, that has a bunch of square asteroids flying around on the screen. And today I wanted to put the, the initial cut at the ship into it. And the ship in the case of asteroids, I'm doing sort of an homage to the 1979 asteroids. So the ship is- 79 the, asteroids. So the, the, the ship- I lost is, 20 bucks uh, on them in the, in, the, in the series. The ship is a little triangle. Um, and so I had to draw this little triangle. Well, that constitutes nothing much more than add in the code to draw a triangle. And then I added in the code to rotate the triangle because he has to be able to aim around the screen. Um, and then I looked at that code and it was all mostly added in. In fact, I don't think I changed anything uh, at all in the, uh, in the little squares that fly around. But the, the, where the ship was wasn't quite the right code, and the way it moved wasn't quite in the right place, and, uh, and so on. So I then took a couple of lines of code that created it and put it in one nice, neat place with a name on it. And so uh, it was mostly making it work was to add it, but that made the code kind of ugly. And then I smushed it back together in a cleaner form uh, without fortunately enough, without breaking it. Uh, normally we do that with unit tests. I find that with graphical programs like this little asteroids game, it's very hard to write a unit test that says this, there is a triangle on the screen in the middle. And it's really easy with your eyeballs to look at the screen and say, oh, the triangle is way off to the left. It's not in the middle and fix the, fix the problem. But one way or another, we try to maintain the behavior without uh, without, uh, while improving the, uh, the code itself. And, and that works within the, the shell, I believe, uh, I would call it, of understanding design and what good design is. And so for those of us who are programmers, 
uh, it becomes imperative to us that we begin at least to understand what design is. For those of us who are not programmers, who are working at some other level within the organization in which programmers are working, uh, it becomes incumbent upon us to ensure that those folks who are doing the actual work, whether it's here in the United States or whether you, for some reason that you can explain to us later, have outsourced all the work to Elbonia, I suppose we could pay them in mud. Uh, those folks need to know how, what good design is and how you go about creating a design, which is something I find lacking pretty much every place I go. Uh, and so one of the things I think is going to cause us to crash as a, as a economy, as a world based on software is the fact that we are putting out lots and lots of stuff that is poorly designed and, and can, it cannot survive for very long. Uh, and I find that unfortunate and scary. It is scary. Um, and it, I think it is in part caused because the, develop, the developer population is supposedly doubling every five years, which means there's an awful lot of programmers with less than five years experience. I've been trying to watch what I've been eating. I know, I know I have the same problem, but you know, with the, with the stand at home and everything, there's just only so much you can do, so you have to eat. Um, but I think as well that there is another issue, which is, which speaks to kind of everyone else on a, on a Scrum or Agile project, which is if the team is put under pressure to deliver more than they can at, uh, at their ongoing pace, they will crash and burn and they will start cutting corners. If you, you know, if you can uh, run a mile in eight minutes, as I'm sure Chet can do, um, and somebody tries to make you run it in four minutes, you're either going to collapse halfway through, or if it was really important to get to the end of the mile within the four minutes, you're going to take a shortcut. And programmers will do that as well. That there is a there is a speed at which a team can currently develop new features, and it's not definable, but it's there. And if they try to go faster than that, they stumble. They take shortcuts. They do things that are going to make the system worse. Uh, and that pressure is almost never self-imposed. I mean, it's partly self-imposed because we all, you know, want to do well, but it's mostly imposed by what seem like well-considered notions, like when the team says, okay, I think we can do these five items. The product owner or the, God save us, the scrum master says, let's have a stretch goal. Why don't we go for seven? Now the team feels on the hook to go for seven, and they, why is she making that face? The team is, feels like they're on the hook for seven. And Sorry, Ron. <laughs> it was Nigel, and I had to wave because he's across the pond. Sorry. Um, so they try and go faster than they can really go, and they stumble, and they make shortcuts and the code gets worse. So I think it's a combination of maybe not knowing, not having all the design skills you might have, but also the pressure that says, we don't have time for that hoity-toity fancy design stuff. Uh, we need you to get these features done right now. And, the, and, uh, and that's sort of the gift that keeps on giving because people, uh, once you've done that, you, you're stuck in that mode forever. You, you are constantly pushing uh, against the, the, the mud you left behind and it only gets worse. Uh, and it leads us to do all kinds of very unfortunate things. Uh, and none of it's good. None of it's good. And there's, there's lots of things that makes that bad. Uh, one of the most basic things is that you're taking the cost associated with feature A and you're exporting part of it to some other feature down the road. And therefore, feature J becomes more expensive. And it's harder to make rational decisions in that kind of marketplace. Uh, this is what we in economics call an externality. Uh, and, and that's bad. It's bad. It's, it's, it's basically pollution, which is what, another form of externality. Uh, and so it makes it difficult to do work effectively. And, and it slows us down and does all kinds of awful things to us. 
But unless we do something proactively as a team, as a company, as a, as a whatever, uh, those kinds of things happen to us, mostly because we've not taken the time to look at what really good work is. Uh, you know, in Scrum, uh, we have this idea, this thing called a working agreement. And, you know, and, and it'd be really nice if, if built into every, work, every working agreement for every Scrum team in the world was the notion that they should be allowed to do the best work they can do. Yeah, and that's we an often odd, leave that kind of idea out. It's that's an odd thing, thing isn't it? Have too much pizza. That everybody on the project surely wants the thing to work. They wouldn't ask for the feature if they didn't want the feature to work. Um, and yet, for some reason, all of us, in one way or another, in, in so many of our efforts, do things that get in the way of the very thing we want. Um, and it's it's uh, it's troubling. I mean, I, it literally bothers me. It is the thing that bugs me the most about the whole agile thing. Is that it was very clear to the authors. It was very clear to the early agile people uh, that there was a proper pace to doing the work. That there were proper technical things that you had to do in order to be able to deliver software in this incremental fashion. Um, everyone knew it. And I know that every teacher has tried to communicate it to, to their students and it trickles down and it just gets less and less communicated somehow until practically anywhere one goes uh, to, to, to find a, a scrum project that you know, maybe has never really had any training other than possibly one of their scrum masters has been trained someplace. You find people stepping on their own feet. You find people uh, making a mess and then wondering why they have a mess. And it's, it's, uh, it's really odd. Chet has passed out. Uh, Chet's writing something down. And no, he, Chet, what's wrong? He, he's, uh, he, Chet's going to write this, and and you can tell the story. I wonder if I can see it. I'm going to have to push a button to change what camera I am using. I hope you wrote with a bigger pen than the other one. I can't see that. You're going to have to get better eyes. Well, it's what a little tiny like? icon on the screen, isn't it? What? It's a little tiny icon on the screen, isn't it? Well, you can, uh, if I talk, it'll get bigger. How's that? I'll, hell, let me, let me, uh, In fact, let me, it doesn't get bigger when you talk. It doesn't get bigger. How things are supposed to get bigger when I talk. What if I do that? Okay. I got a speaker view. Maybe that's something good. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, over the desktop. Oh, look at that. Calc. Fed tax. Oh, I think Chad is, t is telling us a little story about a program we saw, uh, not, too long ago, uh, when we do our, uh, our certified Scrum developer class, uh, we're basically calculating a, a payroll um, because it's a nice project because it has lots of calculation and not a lot of weird gooey work that's hard to do. Um, and we were teaching a class uh, a little while ago, probably longer ago than I'd like to remember, and we found some code in it that kind of looked like this. It said calculate the federal tax and we tell them federal tax is 25% of gross. You know, we don't need to run a big tax kind of a thing. And so they said, calculate federal tax. Federal tax is 25% of gross. So right there, gross pay tax 25. And then when you do the output, uh, it just went away. Francesca took over. Hello, hello, hello. There you go. Okay. I, I tried to pin. Yes, you should pin. Um, and then when they go to display the federal tax, they return fed tax at, divided by 100. Now, the interesting thing is, we looked at that code, and we saw not only that it is bizarre and wrong, we, we, asked, them, answer. we asked them, why do you divide by 100? I recall you saying, this line of code right here, what does that mean? What does this code do? What does this mean? Why is this here? Your fingers oh. moved across the keyboard and typed that in, what Somebody was going on in your head when that happened? What is it? 
And we, we interrogated them for probably longer than left them comfortable. Um, and the team could not answer the question. They stood mute. Why, why, did, why does it look like this? Why did you divide Fed tax by 100? Now, I know why they did it, which yeah. is they originally had done this. And it was they got the wrong answer. And it, it was 100 times, times too much. Big. Yes. And so they fixed it. Well, so they fixed it. Um, probably gross pay times 0.25 would have been a better solution. <laughs> Uh, because 25%, as you probably know, is 25 divided by 100. Um, if they just put that 100 up here. Percent means. If you go to slash over there, it would, you know, we would have accepted it. We would have even, you know, we might have said that could be written more compactly, but we would not have objected. Well, you know, the compiler would have figured that out for him. It would, it would have done something. It would have probably done a decent job and not done a divide since it was a constant. It was a good compiler. My compiler wouldn't do it. A good compiler would do it. So, well, it was odd there because the team kind of literally did not know what they were doing. And these were the cream of the crop, you know, these were the ones that got to go to the class. And, and it, it, it was disturbing to me. Um, and I don't, I don't have a solution for that. Um, I, you can't, Imagine that you tried to teach developer classes, you know, the way we used to teach. Remember when we, when classes used to be taught in a room where the, everybody came together in the old days? Remember that? Um, I do, I do. I, I don't want to answer that. So in, if you tried to teach programmers how to program using that kind of a class, no one could afford either the time or the money to do it. Um, because those kind of classes are expensive and people don't really spend a lot of money training their programmers by and by and large. And so there needs to be something in the world that, that helps people learn those things, helps people learn to understand their own code and to have their code say what they mean. Perhaps, perhaps what we need are like state sponsored institutions where people would go for two, three, four, five years and learn all the stuff you actually need to know in order to be successful out in the world in whatever kind of profession uh, uh, that you were intended to go into, and where they would teach them the things you need. Uh, you, well, if you think about that, though, if you're going to have that sort of an institution, you'd probably need maybe three or four years before they got to go to that institution where they learned the things that they needed to know to go to that institution. And then maybe they'd need eight or nine years. Be, good God, who's that? <laughs> um, then they'd need eight or nine years before that to even be allowed to go to that four-year thing. So, so the next thing you know, people would, you know, would be going through 17, 20 years of, of learning, and that, that simply wouldn't do. Yeah, yeah. And so as a result, we're left with, with bad code out in the world that's expensive to change, that doesn't do what we want it to do, that sometimes causes our airplanes to fly straight into the ground or whatever sorts of things that happen, make, makes you know, your bill at the, at the Walmart come out wrong or whatever terrible things can happen to one. Uh, and that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate, you know, and, and one of the great disappointments I think in my life and Ron's life is, is we, we, thought we knew the answer to this. And, and somehow it's gotten diluted by, uh, I don't know what. So I wonder, uh, you know, what should we do? Um, and I, I think that the part of what we all try to do is, uh, when we teach Scrum and so on, those of us who at least understand the, the, the concept, we try to communicate Yes, you need good technical practices as part of your Scrum. And, but if you think about what you've got in a Scrum class, you've got two days to cover everything you've got to cover. And believe me, it takes more than two days to even begin to scratch the surface on what it means to not write divided by 100 on your federal tax. Um, and the people that need to learn that are not in the room. 
so that somehow we have to get across to the people who are trying to do Agile out there in the world today, which I think is probably most of these 75 or so people that are talking to us right now, are listening to us right now, that those people need to understand that their technical people really need to understand how to program, and not only that, but how to program in an Agile fashion. And that if they do not understand that, what they're gonna find is that they get less done than they would like, and it doesn't work as well as they would like. And the conclusion that is too easy to draw is Agile doesn't work. Well, what the real conclusion is, you weren't doing Agile, um, because if you're not able to do the technical practices, uh, it would be like if I were to try and run a mile and discover that I couldn't run for a mile, and then I would say running doesn't work. No, it's being an old man with, you know, in not particularly good exercise habits that doesn't work. It's not running that doesn't work. A lot of plenty of people go running by my house. I don't seem to be able to keep up with them. That's my problem. Similarly, if the team can't produce software at a constant rate that works, that isn't a problem with Agile. That isn't a problem with Scrum. That's a problem with the team. Well, I hope you all are uh, uh, really uh, really motivated and and very cheerful so far. Very cheerful so far. You know, just going out here going, "Yay, those guys are just fantastic." They 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 just were really pumped up by this this wonderful things they told us about how doomed we are. Uh, But you are doomed, and you heard it here first. So, you know, that's life. It's life is pain. What is what is interesting though, and I and I think this is it's a I think it's important to recognize that. Being excellent at whatever it is you're trying to do, whatever your little company is doing, uh, whatever kind of software you're trying to write, is not easy. Um, it, and yet, if, if you imagine one person programming, me programming on my iPad over here to write Asteroids program, um, everything about that program is gonna be in my head and on my piece of paper and on my computer and it's going swimmingly, you know, it's just, it uh, tends to work. If you tried to write a real video game with the tens of people it takes to do the artwork and the super high speed video code you have to write and all the strange things you have to do, even if you had people who were smarter than me, which is not hard to do, you'd have tens of them, hundred of them, and getting a hundred people to do something and do it well is just plain difficult. It's harder if they don't know how to do it. And unfortunately, in our scrum, many of our scrum teams today, they also kind of don't know how to do it. But you got to expect that it's going to be difficult and that it's going to require attention and that it's going to require continually improving. You probably remember that scrum has these things called retrospectives where you're actually supposed to improve. At the end of the sprint, you're supposed to talk about how things went and how to improve. And if every time you go into that retrospective, you're thinking, well, none of the code worked and we only got one of the five things done and you don't do something to get the code to work and to get more than one of those five things done, you're not doing what they told you to do. And it, might be hard sometimes. You may have to say, well, for starters, we have to stop trying to do seven. If we could have done, just done five, we would have done five, but no, we had to do seven. You will probably come down to the point where what you need to do is one story. And if you get that one story done in the first two days of the sprint, then do another one. And if you don't get it done by the end of the sprint, figure out why and take a smaller story until you get good at whatever scale, whatever small scale you can do it, and then build on that and build on that and build on that. And it's quite easy to do in in the sense that you can have these meetings and you can talk to all these people, but it is not easy to do it well. It's not easy to have an effective retrospective that really makes things better. It's not easy to have an effective planning meeting that figures out everything you're gonna do in a week in two hours. 
But if it's taking you five hours to figure out what you're going to do in one week sprint, Scrum says to cut that back. Scrum says to get it down to two hours. The reason it says to do that isn't just to make you have pain. It's to make you learn to be good at having that meeting and getting it figured out in two hours. And so the tools are all there. Um, the, as much as I am not the world's biggest fan of Scrum, everything you need is in there if you will only do it. And the training is there. There are advanced trainings. There are books you can read. Did you know that there are books about Scrum? Um, I've heard that. Yeah, there are. There are, there are quite a few of them, actually, and many of them are good. Um, there's training. There's things you can read. There's websites that teach you how to do it. There's users groups that you can go to to learn how to do this stuff. And you can, in fact, improve. And you, if you were to improving every week, you know, you'd be pretty good by the end of the year. Well, let, let me say something about the, that act of improving. Because the, the world we have been painting, to me, seems a little bleak at the moment. It does. I'm very sad. But, but the truth of the matter is that all the things one does to start getting better, those steps you take, it have been, in my experience, lots of fun. That getting a little bit better is a wonderful thing. Uh, learning a little more skill, learning a new thing to do is incredibly enjoyable. And, and one of the things that might make this, this uh, uh, less uh, bleak is the fact that the thing that happens to get you out of that is fun every day if you're doing it well. And, and to some degree, the way you know you're doing it right is because it is fun. It does bring joy. Uh, and, and that's the cool thing about it. We did, we did not come up with all this stuff, uh, uh, to be oppressive. We came up with it because it was the most fun way of building stuff we had found so far and still is. And I think that's good because, you know, uh, uh, a happy team builds good, builds good stuff. Uh, and I think that's important. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's the. I was thinking, you know, I've been programming since 1962. Let me see the hands of all the people who weren't alive in 1962. Um, and the last time I programmed was this morning, unless you count the little tiny program I wrote this afternoon, um, because it is fun. And it is fun because I'm fairly good at it. Um, you would hope after over half a century, I would be fairly good at it. Um, <laughs> but Scrum and Agile processes are the same way that as you begin to get fairly good at it, you don't have to be fantastic at it. As you begin to get fairly good at it, they become more joyous. They become more, uh, they feel, it feels smoother. It feels like, like you're actually doing it right. Um, you know, sometimes when you, when you begin to build up skill in anything, it starts just feeling like you're doing it right. It's just kind of, oh yeah, this is just kind of go along here. This is not a big deal. Um, and you're still focusing and concentrating and maybe doing very precise stuff, but it feels like you're doing it right. So what you need to figure out in your scrum is how can we begin to make us all feel like we're doing it right? Because as it, if it begins to feel smooth, you're moving in the right direction. If it starts feeling rough and jaggy, and if you're upset, and if at the end of the day you have to have a really stiff drink, you're not doing it right. And it's not that hard to do it right if you, if as a team you sit down and say, all right, what would make this better? What would, what would we have to do to, to really make this be more like a place you would like to be? Um, and you may have to, to do some things that one and or two people think are tricky. Like you might have to uh, explain to the product owner that you really shouldn't try and do 20 things in one sprint. You should try and do a very small number. Um, they will quickly find that if you do them and get them done, you go faster. Uh, but it takes a little time to, to get that comfort. It takes a little time to get comfort with anything. You have to practice. And then one day you just discover that you're doing it. Chet, Ron? Yes. Um, 
I don't know if you guys have a game plan as to where you want it to, uh, to run to, but uh, Nigel just jumped in. And so I'm going to ask Nigel, if you can unmute yourself and join the conversation. Cool. Nigel. Looking around is like me? Hello, me? Where do I? <laughs> how, do I mute, how do I mute this? Did you bring us any more, Mike? No, yeah. not this time, not this time. But uh, I, I think I think a truly great gift I gave the American people with uh, oh, that funny. food. Possibly the best thing ever. <laughs> so what do you think? Nice. About we recommend Marmite Tiley. It's, it's lovely, isn't it? I can't imagine why the concept of a yeast extract spread on bread has not spread to the United States of America. You know, it, 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 it's all the goodness of yeast in an extract. It, it's wonderful stuff. Compact form, you know. We go around yeah, and we have to eat you know, raw yeast in order to get that, whereas you mm. have it concentrated yeah. in the UK. Concentrated. Yeah, I just, Nigel, I want to tell everybody, Nigel's a, a certified scrummer, scrum trainer, a developer like uh, Ron and Chet, and I met him at the scrum. Nobody like Nigel. Uh, nobody, I, you know, I met him at the scrum gathering a couple years ago, and I, I said that it, how fun it would be to get the three of you guys in a room to teach a CSD course. Um, so I just wanted to give you a shout out. A lot of people are talking about your uh, your video that just dropped. One of the CSD. Oh, yes. What was that thing called? It was uh, it's a, it's the Nigel scale, my world famous self named scale that uh, I uh, decided, um, studied a variety of scaling frameworks which no man should have to do, by the way, <laughs> um, to, uh, to analyze them in depth and to feel the true depths of horror that Ron and Chet have been discussing recently. I, so, I, so. I uh, particularly enjoyed your comments about disciplined agile. Oh, yes, yes. Which I was, thought... life is too short. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely couldn't face it. I couldn't face <laughs> spending 20 minutes analyzing a disciplined agile from a, from a, a values and principles point of view. Yeah, but uh, it's cool. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's it's interesting in terms of what you were saying about all the common sense things that need to happen. Oh, lovely one! Is the uh, people forget their principles when they scale, and that's what I've been discovering more and more. As people start thinking big, they start forgetting the fundamentals that got them there. Right. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that uh, they can uh, go to YouTube and find your series of agile videos. Mm -hmm. Feel like flying you know once we're able to fly again um, <laughs> so i think the borders are closed between for airlines between our two countries right now yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah soon enough we'll get on the planes and we'll be healthy and we'll we'll uh we'll have some scrum and agile stuff together if you guys in the audience there's still a, a, a lot of you for questions and answers for ron and chet um and of course, Nigel, too, if you want to jump in, you could either, you know, you, yeah, it's up to you. If you want to use the chat feature, I can read off some of the questions and answers so we don't um, have you to. The questions, we'll read the answers. Yeah, yeah you don't want me answering a question about. Well, um, the answers, too, that's all right. Well, the extreme programming I give might not be, uh, I might be in that group you were talking about that disappoints you. Um, so anyways, if people have questions, you can. Um, you know, let me, uh, I'm gonna go to the chat feature and I'll look for it. I'll give you guys a second. If um, anybody uh, wants to private message me or do the question to the whole group, that's good. Or if you're really feeling brave, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question too, as long as we don't have everybody try and go at once. That's why I thought the chat feature would be good. Um, I, I'd ask you, Ryan and Chet, do you guys have any books? You mentioned books, any books you recommend that people read? Um, or look at to learn how to do agile really well. I would think that everyone should need should have at least one copy of the nature of software development. I don't recall the author's name. Uh, I wouldn't know it was me. Yeah, well, actually it was. Uh, there's a yeah, yes. And so it's it's actually a tiny little book uh, that that actually talks about why you have to do the things you have to do in order to get the things you claim to be wanting. Uh, and it's written in, in, in almost the form of tweets. It's very short, uh, little, little bits of things with pictures and things uh, designed for the, the reading impaired like most uh, management, ma managers. Uh, and so I think that's an excellent place to start. Uh, quite frankly, a, a place people should start as well is, is Kent Beck's book on extreme programming uh, in, in uh, 
Extreme Programming uh, Explained. Explained, is that the first one? Yeah. The white book. Uh, it still talks, so it's still very good about talking about why you have to do the things you have to do. Uh, some of them technical, but some of them very basic, basic ideas of, of Agile that exists in XP and Scrum and all the real Agile processes. And I think those are very fundamental books. Read those. Uh, those two things, and you'll know an awful lot, and you may not need a whole lot more. You should be able to figure out what works for you uh, from those two, along with a couple, you know, a couple days of really excellent training. I, I, I always recommend. Yes, um, I would mention as well a book that I that I like, but that you have to be careful with, which is Ken Rubin's Scrum book. Um, it's very detailed. Um, and quite thick and full of all kinds of stuff. And it, you, it's a little bit like Discipline Agile. It's got too much in it. The difference is what it's got in it is rather good in my opinion. Um, but if, and so you kind of look, look to that one sort of as a, as a way of uh, digging into things. What, what do you think about that book, Nigel? Do you like it? Yeah, I like it. I think it's a lovely book. Um, I think, as you're right, it's just got a lot of things in there. And I yeah. could imagine someone picking up that book and trying to do all of it. <laughs> yeah, you, I, know, you, yeah. you know, the thing about Agile um, is that you want to just have just barely not enough. Mm. And so you get tempted when you read a book like this from Agile that lists a million things you might want to do to thinking that you should do a million things. And you shouldn't. You should have at your fingertips a million possible ideas, perhaps, but you want to do three. You know, you want to do just this one, one more thing, and maybe even take out a practice. Uh, a really, a really interesting one might be um, if you're in your planning meetings, you wind up spending a lot of time estimating. Well, maybe you just don't need to do that. Um, in your in your retrospective meetings, maybe when people talk about the, where well, you estimated this would take in three days and it took four days, what's that's all about? Maybe you just don't want to do that. Maybe it's not really helping. Um, so uh, a book I would have to say I don't want to recommend um, is the currently famous Twice the Work in Half the Time. Um, it's, it's got good material in it, but I think its outlook is wrong. Uh, because it's about let's get twice as work done twice as fast, and it's too easy for for a manager to take that soundbite and demand twice as much work from his team twice as fast um, instead of figuring out what you really have to do in order to get the right amount of work done at the right speed. It is uh, difficult to to fit that in to the to one of the I think probably the best ideas in the Agile Manifesto, which is you want to maximize the quantity of work not done. Yep. So I don't want to get twice the work done. I want to get half the work done and provide four times the value. Uh, and so maximizing the quantity of work not done uh, uh, is something I strive to do every day and I'm getting really close to you know getting nothing done on most days. So I'm really yeah, I'm, I'm almost got, I'm, I may be losing, I may be getting less than, less than one done now, less than zero done. Wow. Today I certainly did. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple questions coming through if you guys want to jump. Did. Sure. Yeah, and we can go back to more books and stuff if you want. Um, Jonas, I have to put my glasses on because my eyes, you can tell I need the readers now. Since Scrum is often mandated by management, developers see it as an imposed heavyweight process hindering them from just writing code. How do you convince developers to embrace Agile? So, Chet, you wanna start? Ron, you wanna start, which one? I would like to start because I always like to say that if I were good at convincing people to do things, I would have been a salesman, not a programmer. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, in fact, Scrum seems to be imposed and seems to be making people do a whole lot of stuff, you're doing it wrong. Scrum has this many meetings, it has this many roles, it time boxes all of the wasted time down to, you know, two hours for a planning meeting every two weeks and stuff like that. If you're doing a burdensome Scrum, you're not doing Scrum. 
Well, I, I would like to reflect and start my answer based on something Ron said many years ago that I was just reminded of on Twitter, which is those folks don't really know what we're doing anyway, and therefore we should do the right thing. Uh, and so if I'm being told I have to do Scrum, I ought to learn what Scrum is and really do that. Really do that because they just told you you had to do Scrum. And it turns out Scrum is this very compact, very simple little thing. And how can they possibly, how can you possibly get into trouble for doing exactly the thing they told you to do, which was do Scrum. And so I would use that as authority to do the right thing in the same sort of way that people used to ask me, how do I get permission to do test driven development? And I always said, go to your manager and say, is it okay if we test? And if they say yes, then you have permission to do test driven development. And if they say no, do it anyway, because they don't know what you're doing anyway. <laughs> yeah, generally asking permission to do good work is kind of a silly thing to do, isn't it? It tells you something about the organization you're embedded in. Uh, well, it and, tells you something about Martin Fowler always says, uh, change your organization or change your organization. Yeah. Uh, now, if, if you have programmers that just want to program, I th which I think is, is common, because the nice thing, it used to be the case that when you were programming, you know, that they would come in and say, how long will it take you to do this? Six months. And you would do whatever you wanted to do for six months. And only after six months did you get in trouble. Um, the... The programming part is fun, and I, and I'm all in favor of people that just want to want to do that technical work. The trick is that if you're going to do it in a Scrum situation, you have to learn to produce an increment every two weeks or every week, however long your sprint is. And so, um, I if I were managing a team of people that just wanted to program, I would basically tell them, "That's fine. I need to see working software every week." And as long as you are showing me a reasonable progression of working software every week, you can do it any way you want to. And by the way, if you start having trouble doing your software every week, which I believe you will, given what I know of your habits right now, I will provide you with the training and the reading and the time to learn how to do it. Uh, I would do that because I think programmers are interested in learning if they're, uh, if they're given the opportunity and that they are capable of learning if they are given the opportunity. And because I think as a manager, you should manage based on the results you want, not on how people get the results. Even though you might well know, as I well know, what they need to do, I'm happy to let them learn what they need to do, but they have to give me what I want, which is I wanna see software every two weeks, or every week. Actually, I wanna see software every day, but I'd settle for every week. All right, cool. We got like a few more questions coming through. So I wanna, I'm gonna read them verbatim. Um, let's see what we got here. I would like to understand how operational documentation is created and kept current on agile projects, especially when changes are occurring every two weeks. We use JIRA and Confluence in our company. Agile tends to not focus on documentation, but just knowledge articles that operations must have to support the application. Can you share some best practices on this? Well, I'm gonna ignore the fact that you've done, you've bought some religion that you probably didn't actually believe in, which, which is what happens when you buy somebody's, buy a tool, you're buying somebody's religion. Uh, in Scrum, uh, we have this thing called definition of done, which describes the end point of your product. Uh, by uh, uh, around everything except the actual feature set. We have to build our product to its definition of done every sprint and our team has to have the skill to build that product to that definition of done every sprint. And so if I have some requirement around some documentation, well that becomes part of my definition of done. I can't say I'm done unless I have done that. And so you make that part of your definition of done. And every time somebody touches your product, one of your developers touches the product, they aren't done, your team isn't done, your development team isn't done until it's gotten to the definition of done. And therefore that documentation has to be created. 
Now, I used to write it. I have a story. I have a story about that. Let me, let me say one more thing, which is you notice the rate at which you can do that. And that tells you how fast you're actually going. If you leave out stuff, then by George, it looks like you're going a whole lot faster up until the day you discover you didn't do everything you had to do, in which case you have this big bolus of work that is unaccounted for. And so you have to be done at the end of every sprint. And, and if you have to do documentation, that's how you do it. You have to have somebody on your team who can create it. Otherwise, you're not doing black letter scrum, you're doing the things scrum says you have to do. You, you, Ron has a story. I do. Um, I was uh, consulting with a company called QRS in California, uh, who may or may not still exist. Um, and they were building a product and they were building it in an agile fashion and they were building it very well. They were actually uh, producing features quite, you know, quite frequently as they wanted to do. Um, and they said to me, the problem we have with this thing is we're getting these features done, but we aren't getting the manual done because we get the features done this week and we, can, we give the information to the tech writer at the end when we've got it done and then they write it up. And so obviously the manual's not done at the time that, that the feature is. And we've tried uh, just kind of telling them, having them come to the planning meetings, but it doesn't really help because we change things over the course of the week. And so everything changes. So what should we do? I told them, first of all, that there was an article on my website that, that said, look, when I write something in programming, it has to actually work. When you write a manual, it doesn't have to compile. It's easier to write text than it is to write code. Um, therefore, you should be able to write text at the same rate you write code. And I recommended in this article, I said, that you simply have a tech writer sit with you and the tech writer writes the manual at the same time as you write the code. And I was talking to the whole group, you know, the whole organization, tech writers and testers and everybody at that time. And I said, is there anybody, in, any tech writer in the room who's crazy enough to try that? And a woman raised her hand and said, I'm crazy enough to try that. And she moved her little kneeling chair that she had into the room with the programmers. And from that day on, she kept the manual up to date with the work. You just have to do it. And it's just not that hard. Same with the operational manual. Does operational manual doesn't even have to be as pretty as the user manual. Um, you simply do it. That's right. The code, the actual punctuation has to be correct. Yeah, right. You could leave a period out of a you manual. You put a comma where you should have had a semicolon in your manual. Nobody notices. But you do that in your code. Boom. <laughs> Blows up. Yeah, we've got, I think, like, uh, we're coming up on almost five minutes will be an hour. We'll take a few extra minutes if we have to. We've got about five questions um, left that I'm getting. I'm going to read one out. Um, our management thinks they support our dev teams in using Scrum, but have demanded a release plan many months into the future, and that dev team um, commit to delivering the features on that plan. Any suggestions on how to explain that, uh, in quotes, things change, and in quotes, discovery happens, and in quotes, again, estimates or guesses, how do we explain that without me getting fired? <laughs> Yeah, so else do it. Uh, I, I, I am no expert in not getting fired, so I, I can't actually help you with that. Yeah, you see us uh, not having jobs, don't you? Yeah, we've not <laughs> had jobs in quite a long time. Uh, well, you know, of course, you, you know, one of the ways one becomes happy, I suppose, is acting as if you don't really care whether you get fired or not, and that, that often confuses them, and therefore you, you are okay. Uh, you know, I... Uh, all we can do is show them what we are doing. Now, if, if having some particular feature set completed and ready to go six months into the future, which is an odd way to work today, because you know, the companies that are really good are doing things like that every four minutes. But if that's really important, Scrum and Agile XP gives us tools to have that. Uh, we can build a product that can ostensibly do those things in that time frame. The, the, the secret to that is understanding what bits to leave out. Uh, I have several metaphors for this. Uh, one, one I'm going to go with right now it has to do with 
with lossy compression. Uh, if you take a piece of music, a piece of audio of any type, and you run it through a program and create an MP3 of it, which is a much smaller file than the full WAV file would have been for it. And the reason that file is smaller, one of the reasons that file is smaller is it throws parts of it away. It throws parts of the audio away. And it uses algorithms to figure out what parts it thinks you're not going to notice. It turns out in Scrum, we have a person responsible for that called product owner. Their job is to look at all those things those people want and figure out how to give it to them in such a way that they think they got everything they asked for. And leaving the bits out, they're not going to notice. And so when it comes to slicing, slicing down at very small levels allows us to do that. If we can only put in a whole feature or leave a whole feature out, then we can't do that. And so one of the things we have to get good at is slicing things down small enough that we can deliver them the 50, the 30 percent of the effort that gets them the 80 or 90 percent of the thing they wanted in such a way that they don't notice they didn't get the other 10 or 20 percent. Right. And so you can do that. I want to I want to flip that upside down now. If you have to produce that document, the, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask the questioner was, uh, tell me whether you have a product owner in your department and whether they have authority and responsibility, because if you will read the Scrum documents even slightly carefully, you'll discover that it is the product owner that is responsible for maximizing the delivery from the team, not the developers. The product owner decides what you're gonna do. Now, what you do if you have to produce a plan for six months out is it needs to be a high level plan. It needs to say, we'll have the ability to use credit cards and we'll have the ability to sell products and we'll have the ability for people to to see their previous orders and we'll have the ability to show pictures of the products and we'll have, you know, and what nice high level thing, lots of words about it, but not a lot of detail. So that within those things, it can be, yes, we do support your credit cards, but it really isn't as easy to put them in as we would have liked. And we'll make that, we'll make that a feature that we add on next time and next time and next time. So that you, because you know you're going to slice these things thin, you describe them thin. You don't describe them in infinite detail. And then what you do, and this is very important in my opinion, is you very, very quickly get all five of them in to the product in the thinnest possible way. So that from virtually the very beginning, the product is actually working. It's just kind of ugly and then you let you look at the thing and you say well obviously the page that shows the products really needs to be really pretty because that's what sells the products okay we spend a lot of time working on that the ability to put in your credit cards ah, that, you know that's it's not bad it's you know it's a form you fill it out and leave it alone so that you you the product owner devises a product plan that gives her the best possible chance of producing a product that meets the apparent plan and is actually good and useful to use at the same time. And that's what you're supposed to do. Probably the questioner didn't even have an empowered product owner, but that's just a bet that I would make on the side. Question? Yeah, the uh, next question I have, um, I can guess this answer. What do you think an organization should start with? A, improving developers' programming skills or B, Developing an organization's agile practices. Developing a what? Agile or practices. Their agile practices. So you work with the developers first and getting their programming skills better, or develop the organization's agile practices. What does that mean? I don't even know what I that means. Before one decides to do anything, <laughs> one kind of needs to know where where you are to start with. Uh, you should always look around to see where the biggest bang for your buck is. Uh, now, I would bet that increasing your developer skills is probably a good chance of being the place where that is. But, but you know, uh, there's an old saying, you know, that if you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going, any map works. And so, like any good, what we call transformation in the silly business I do, 
the first thing we have to figure out is where are we? And where is it we think we want to be and figure out how we're going to get sort of from here to there in some vague way, knowing that along the way, there's probably going to be dragons and stuff we're going to have to go around. Uh, and so the first step always is, where are we? Uh, do we have programmers who, who are pretty low skill? Uh, uh, do we have structures within an organization that allow us uh, to work effectively? Uh, some of those things can be done in parallel. Maybe some of those things should be done in parallel. Uh, but you got to always look, know where you are and know where you're trying to get to and figure out what the first step is and then figure out what the next step is and all that kind of stuff. That's a painful way for folks to go because a lot of organizations want to buy a canned map to the, to the, to the uh, stars homes. And, you know, when I bought one and followed it, then it turns out I ended up in, in Square Lake instead of at Madonna's house because I wasn't where the map started. Got it. Um, Want to say anything about that, Ron? No, I think you pretty much covered what I would, would have wanted to say. All right. Okay. And here's another question for you. had a few more. Tell me when you guys are getting, when you have to go. Um, how do you manage demos if you are doing CI, CD with multiple deployments per sprint? Do you just tell your stakeholders, here's what we built, it's live, got any feedback? The, they pretty the, much, I think that's pretty much exactly yeah. let, me, let me start first with that, Ron, which is, first of all, there is nothing in Scrum called the demo. But in Scrum, there's a thing called the review. And the main question asked in the review is not, did you like what we did? It is, what should we do next? And so if I'm doing continuous delivery, that doesn't change the question, which is, what should we do next? We've done this, what should we do next? And therefore, if you understand why we're really doing this, it doesn't change at all. We're not there to get approval because product owner is the only entity in Scrum that approves. Stakeholders tell us, give us information about what to do next. You want to say anything about that, Rod? You want to say anything about that, Nigel? Um, yeah, Nigel. Do you have a comment, Nigel? Um, well, there again, Chad. I think I think you pretty much covered it. I think I think that's you know that's kind of exactly right. Got it. Um, we got a few other ones. So tell me when you're uh, when you, how do you approach TDD with dev teams? So if you guys want to talk about that, you can. Yeah. Um, I, I what well, I believe that that TDD is of course a very it's actually. Simple idea, but it turns out to be kind of complicated. Uh, nothing simple is easy, I guess you could say. Um, we, as it happens, uh, you know, there is a course on that called Certified Scrum Developer where you can learn TDD. There are online uh, TDD courses in JavaScript and in Java. Um, you can learn TDD in C from James Grenning. There's, there are plenty of resources out there. If you want to learn it, there's a book called Test Driven Development or two. Um, the, I like to show people how to do it, give them a little experience trying it, and then let them decide that it, whether it works for them and, and when. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't believe that we ought to dictate any kind of a process. I don't think we have to dictate Scrum for that matter, uh, much less TDD. But, I think that if you set yourself to delivering code every week that works, you will discover that TDD is just about the only way to do it. I, I, I can't add anything to that. Got it. Um, I think we've got one or two more. Uh, somebody asked a quick question. Do Scrum Masters typically handle and monitor budgets within the project? Uh, mm -hmm. I work as a project manager and trying to separate some of the tasks that each discipline handles. And if you want to. Well, I think, I think that's, that's kind of one of the things an organization has to think about when, when they're moving down the path of, of going towards Scrum or any kind of process like that. Uh, I'm going to say something that we'll see how, what people think about this. I'd like to see what, I'd like to see what Nigel says about this, which is, I believe <coughs> that Scrum exists 
to make the world safe for project managers. That there are things that a project managers are really good at and they should keep doing those things. And there's things that they're not very good at. And Scrum was invented to take that and give it to the people who had the information so they could do that work better. How, what, what Fred is gonna to do tomorrow is not a question for a project manager to answer, it's a question for Fred to answer. And so we have to decide where we're gonna draw that line. And so maybe project managers keep budgety stuff because they have skill to do that and that's perfectly fine. Or you may decide for whatever reason to push that down into the team and whoever is the right person within the team to do that does that as well. Uh, on the original XP project, uh, C3, the budget stuff was handled by one of our programmers, a guy named Rich Garzaniti. And Rich did it because in a previous life, he was a CPA. You're probably not gonna have a CPA on your team. But if you did, maybe they're the guy who ought to handle the budget stuff. And so you never know who the right person is gonna be. And it may be within the team, it may be up someplace else. And you know, whatever happens of that, as long as you, you pay attention to whether that seems like the right idea after you do it for a while, I'm okay with whatever that answer is. Yeah, I like to, I like to some response from Nigel, Nigel about making the world safe for project managers. I think I wouldn't want I like to see people's faces when I say that. I think that there is an issue with respect to the scrum master though, which is the scrum master is supposed to be a servant leader. And you want to be really careful what kind of responsibilities you add to that because that you don't want them interfering with that leadership role and that really supporting leadership role that they have. So for example, a scrum master with hiring and firing capability would not be a good idea. Probably not be a good idea. Um, and so if the scrum, master, the scrum team that gets to hire and fire the scrum master. If the scrum master figures out a budget and then submits it to the budget authority, you know, that falls under Chet's notion of, you know, whoever is best at doing it does it. But if the scrum master had budget enforcement, I would be troubled by it. Nigel, you want to add anything? Uh, just, I think that anything that makes the Scrum Master look like they have any form of authority bends everything. Uh, they say in soccer in the UK and football, if you've got a, a football match between Manchester United, they're like the Dallas Cowboys, I guess. Oh. And um, Liverpool, they're like another American football team. Um, oh. But when the two teams play each other in the UK, the referee can't come from Liverpool and they can't come from Manchester, right? Because the idea is bias. The referee will be biased. Well, the referee's not going to be biased. You know, the referee's a professional. <laughs> They're not going to be biased at all. They, this is their career. But the trouble is 45,000 people in that stadium think the referee is biased and it would get you into a whole heap of trouble. And so for me, I always get concerned with anything like budget in Scrum Master's hands, even if they're facilitating it for the team, even if they're supporting the team through it, it still looks dodgy and the rest of the team may smell some bias in there that may not even exist. So uh, imagined bias rather than perceived bias rather than real. Good deal. Let's see, we've got... Um, Maybe one more. We'll do one more. I think one more, we'll call it tonight. Um, How do I to go to bed? I know, it's late there. We have five or six hours. The last question for the night. When do you, put my glasses on. It's getting smaller and smaller. I'm going to get older. When do you, uh, let me read this. When do you do your story refinement? I prefer to do an extra meeting, time box to one hour, just to refine and slice the story. Then sprint planning cuts to 10 minutes. When do you recommend to do the story refinement? I know it's an activity and maybe doesn't merit another meeting, but a two hour iteration planning seemed to be draining me. Well, I believe you want to keep your, your sprint planning meeting as compact as possible. And backlog refinement, as, as we call it, is, is the key to doing that. And so, and so you do as much of that as you need to, to get your sprint planning meeting to the size that makes you happy. Uh, and that's the heuristic. If, if I'm spending too much time in that meeting with everybody, I probably could have, should have done something before I got here. And that's, that's what you do. And my guess is 
that over time, the size of that activity, the amount of time you spend doing that is going to vary for all kinds of reasons. In the, at the beginning, it's probably going to be a bit longer. After a while, it might get a little bit smaller as we learn more and more things, but you never know. And so, and so I'm happy to do as much of it as I need to and as little as I can get away with before I get to my sprint planning meeting at the beginning of the next sprint. So when everybody stops working or hasn't been able to start yet and we have that meeting, it's as compact as possible. Good deal. Yeah, it sounded to me like the, like the questioners probably doing pretty well if they're keeping their sprint planning meetings that short. Um, uh, I would hope that they would normally not involve the entire team in every refinement session. You probably want to involve uh, a couple of experts, a couple of people that, want, you know, that are germane to whatever stories you're going to talk about um, and not tie the whole team down in the refinement. Yeah, something kind of in the in the three amigos kind of area. Yes, I was going to mention the three amigos idea, which you can find on the internet. I, I, did didn't Woody actually write an entire book about that? I don't know. He, he wrote yeah, a book three about amigos about information, but I don't know. But we'll I, talk about that. But you know, as I always say, you don't you you ought to have the hats, but you don't have to do the dance. Right. Um. I think that's probably all the time we have. Yep. Yep. All right. Sorry, guys. It's not my dinner, so that tells me something. All right. The uh, I'm going to say thank you to Ron and Chet for helping us out. And uh, any questions you guys have, you can always uh, get in contact with. Go to MichiganAgileTraining.com. You can email me there. Um, and uh, I hope you guys all stay healthy. Enjoy uh, the rest of your evening. And uh, that's it for now. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to pop out. Thanks, Chet and Ron. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. All right, Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.